for those that weren't able to be here uh, last night and are here for the first time today, I'd love to introduce Tina to you. Uh, she's with R3 Factor Relationship Lifeline Seminar, and for more than 20 years, Tina has been doing this alongside her, with her late husband, Ron, and uh, are part of our church family, of Coastal Church and their family. Of course, Jenny, uh, we all know Jenny from Holway House, along with her brother, Josh, and we're so thankful that we... Um, we love these people. We've ha we've, they've been in our lives for many, many years, and I think that's why we just with such trust and confidence have, them have her stand on the stage and share the way she does because we've seen the fruit of her labors. And uh, so they've been doing intensive seminars called Relationship Lifeline for, like I said, over 20 years. And uh, as you would have found last night, her teaching style may not be traditional in the sense that we just sit and take notes and, and it's just a download and then we go home and ponder, but it actually takes us through exercises with the R3 factor, which reveals issues from the past, which we did last night, and then what we hold back and then bring into our relationships, how to rewrite our story and then to renew our life so that it's not just surviving but it can be better than it ever has been before. And of course, that relationship is in marriage, but also in every type of relationship that we have. She's a registered professional counselor right here from Vancouver, now living in Orange County, yay, and has worked with such celebrities such as Gene Simmons and Shannon Tweed. If you ever saw the television show, uh, Family Jewels, uh, Tina was on one of those episodes, weren't you? And really, it was so powerful watching them go through some of the exercises in their relationship and really how that was restored. The Real Housewives of OC, you've participated with some of the women there as well, featured on the Today Show and continues to travel around the world with transformation seminars. So without any further introduction, would you please put your hands together and welcome Tina Konkin. Oh, I did it. <laughs> yeah, me and buttons can be a problem. Um, you know, as Pastor Cheryl was introducing me and some of the work that I've done with some of the celebrities, it was funny because uh, when we were first approached by the, by the producers of the Family Jewels, Gene Simmons Family Jewels, they don't reveal to you who the celebrity is. And it took them three months to convince us we wanted to do this because all I had to hear was reality show and you know, this conservative girl from, I'm not conservative spiritually, I'm just conservative when it comes to stuff like that. And, um, and it was just a really tough thing. And Margaret said, look, it sounds all legit. And I said, look, I have one question. Is it a real relationship problem or is it just them trying to create, you know, drama on this show? And um, they said, no, it's a real relationship problem. They assured us. And if, some, if they don't get help, now, the producer's end was, if they don't get help, the show ends, right? And on my part was, was it real? And so we concluded it was. And, and I'm sharing this story because last night I shared with you in review that we wear glasses. And the glasses that we wear to see through, and some of you weren't here last night, so I just want to do a quick review. But the glasses that we wear aren't clear. Because everything that we saw, heard, and experienced growing up in our youth and in our childhood created filters in our glasses. And I call these glasses judgment. And so with these filters, we see our world. We see people and we judge. We judge situations. We judge if you've never been in a church, you've probably judged. Well, no, you have judged. I, I won't be kind. You have. You judge the atmosphere. You judge. You you judged you before you come, and you're saying, I wonder if that. I wonder. If, yeah. I wonder if it's going to be religious, and you know all this stuff, right? I wonder if they're going to take my money. Whatever your thoughts are through what you saw, heard, and experienced growing up, you have a perspective, and we're going to talk later about perspective. Well, I had a perspective on um, church, and I grew up, though I never adopted it, but I grew up in a church that was all about do's and don'ts, and basically what I saw, heard, and experienced was you went to hell for everything, 
Okay, that, that's what I said. So you were more fearful of hell than anything else, and so you just most of the time did what you're supposed to do. Now, that, I, I got to credit my mom for our faith. I never, you know, I knew the real Jesus loved me no matter what. And so I grew up with that kind of faith that we served a good God. I would watch my mom pray and things would happen. And so that's the faith I had. But then later in years, we got involved in this small church. And, and you know, if I'm Italian, that, that should tell you something. It was, it was an Italian church. And it was all about do's and don'ts. And so I remember hearing, I was about, I don't know, 16, 17, when Gene Simmons and the Kiss Band came to town here at the Coliseum. And it was preached right from the pulpit. If any of you kids are in that concert, you will tonight know that you'll make your decision to enter hell and you'll never come back, <laughs> right? I mean, those are what, that's what I heard. You're going to hell if you go to that KISS concert, right? So I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't go. <laughs> you know, I mean, as much as I knew Jesus loved me, I thought I ain't taking that chance, you know. <laughs> And so we didn't go as a youth group. We didn't, you know, nobody we knew went. But guess what the first thought, because of what I saw, heard, and experienced at 16, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but that was a long time ago. As soon as we said yes, and they had their non-disclosure things all signed by with my signature, they suddenly said, it's Gene Simmons from KISS for Family Jewels. And I went, oh, God, I'm going to hell. Those were my, that was my first thought. I'm going to hell and I've actually signed the contract. <laughs> right? So to tell you, to tell you how much power this has is very powerful. Now to you that's funny. But I've experienced a lot of religious damage because of things like that. Now, because I grew up in a faith-based home, I didn't, that didn't affect me. I didn't go. But really, did I really believe I was going to go to hell? <laughs> no. So part of me, you know, wants to help you understand that as we go through the day-to-day, -day, I'm asking you to make a decision to put on a really different pair of glasses that doesn't feel comfortable when you wear them. Don't look natural. Don't feel natural. You can't see because it's not filtering. And the other thing we talked about last night in review was uh, Rob came, and, and they're here with me from Orange County, but we talked about the R3 factor, which is what we're talking about here today. And when I was on breakfast television a couple of days ago, um, I spoke about the three deadly, the three deadly emotions in relationships, all relationships. And those three deadly emotions, if we don't do the R1 first and reveal, that's the R1, that's reveal. So if we don't reveal first, right, something's going to happen. And that is that we're going to start keeping yesterday and the unresolved issues of yesterday. So if we don't reveal yesterday, then those deadly emotions will begin to appear. Because anything that is unresolved will eventually turn to anger. And that's your first deadly emotion in relationships. You become angry inside. Angry doesn't always mean screaming and yelling. Anger doesn't always mean you're acting out. Angry can be internal and start killing you internally. And then the second one in the deadly emotions is anger will often turn to resentment. When you begin to resent life and people, your relationships begin to die. And you begin to withdraw. And then the third one is bitterness. And the Bible talks about bitterness. And it says, let not bitterness set in because it will actually make you sick. It says it will actually rot your bones. And so as if we don't reveal these deadly emotions, and in a minute I'm going to talk about these rocks, but if we don't reveal these deadly emotions, 
by rewriting, which is the R2. We need to rewrite today. Rob said it well last night. He said, you know, you can't change your past. There's nothing about what happened 10 minutes ago or two hours ago or even as you drove here that you can change. You can't change the guy that cut you off in front of you. But you can change how you feel about it. Because in that moment, if you're a man, you had some emotional stuff going on because he cut you off and didn't signal. Be honest. Does that happen? Or did that just happen to my husband? <laughs> right, okay. So we've got some real men here that get, what do they call it, road rage. You can't change that. But are you going to let that control you all day today? Are you going to let that come into your relationships today? Or can you rewrite it? What if the guy that cut me off really didn't see me? Or what if he really is rushing to a hospital call that his child was just in an accident? What if? And see, when I feel some stuff going up inside of me, I don't succeed every time, but I do my best. What if that woman behind you know, I think they showed a clip about cold soup, if you were here last Sunday. When I first got married, things would trigger me. And especially when I believed you were there to serve. So in other words, I'd been a waitress, and I knew it was my job to serve even the ugliest people emotionally. And the ones that were abusive. Well, I shouldn't have become one of them, but I was one of them. And it would aggravate me until I began to live my life by what if. You know, there's a Bible in the, in the, there's a verse in the Bible that says, if any man, any person is in Christ, they're new inside. And I thought, how do I do that? How do I rewrite what I'm feeling right now so I can renew it and make it better? Well, I started making up different stories in my mind. When that person standing at Walmart was looking down and not really paying attention and she was going slow and, you know, and I'm going like, hello, like, you know, today would be okay, you know, and she's playing with her thing because her, you know, tape isn't quite right and she's trying to get the paper tape and it would just cause such stuff inside of me. Like, do you not have a life? <laughs> you know, like, do you not know we're busy? Like, we want to just pay and go. Or the ones that would be all nice, too nice. They want to know all about your life while you just want to get out, right? <laughs> Any of that could cause all kinds of rocky emotions in me. Now, I know that doesn't happen to you, but to me it happened. And so I had to learn how to rewrite today in that moment. And so what I started seeing was, what if she's got three kids at home and she's a single mom and has to work here and one of her kids is sick this morning? but she can't afford to stay home. What if that's why her countenance doesn't really see me? Or what if the really nice person is scared to lose her job and she's been trained to be nice and be personal? So she's just doing her job. What if? Would that change how I looked at things? That's how I rewrite in the moment. How do I renew tomorrow is, you know what, I don't want to do a whole lot of rewriting. So when something aggravates me, I'm going, I don't live there. That's okay. If it's triggering me, I own it. It's mine. My anger is mine, not theirs. They can't trigger it unless I let them. And that's how you renew tomorrow. So we, we did that last night, and then we did the rocks. I need to know where Pastor Dave is. He's not here. That means Josh and Mary might be in big trouble. <laughs> and he's already going, no. And I don't want to ignite anger in him because that's a deadly emotion. <laughs> and, I, and I need that relationship. Who can I pick? Who would just volunteer? I need a couple to volunteer. Oh, look at that. Ron and Sonia, come on up here. I knew I could count on you guys. And because they've been through our program, I don't think they've done it anyway because it's something new. So get up here, quick. Fast. <laughs> this is intense. You don't do anything slow. Move it. You're starting to trigger stuff. <laughs> this is Ron and Sonia. Ron and Sonia have a phenomenal story. 
They've been in our lives since 19? 2000. 2000. 2000, they came through one of our programs, and they've got an amazing story because... We're still um, trying to get fixed. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. That wasn't what I wanted to hear right now. They're still working on it anyways. And, but Ron and Sonia came in totally broken, and there was no way he was... They weren't even married, and there was no way he was going to marry her. And uh, Ron had somewhat of a... I'm not going to call it a faith background. I'm just going to call it a religious background. He was born again, but was very religious. Maybe still is a little bit. And um, they're not going to talk. They're going to do something. And then Sonia... <laughs> and Sonia was an atheist. So... That's how they arrived. Sonia now is born again, loves Jesus, and Ron is still trying. No, you love Jesus. <laughs> you love Jesus. <laughs> but he told me yesterday, that, that, that's, why I'm gonna I, that's why I'm putting him under, I, that's why I'm pulling him under the rug, is because yesterday he said, I said, Ron, did you have any of those anxieties? You were dying? He goes, yeah, and I kept them. I said, you didn't rip it up. He goes, no, I got to go deal with this. I'm going, Ron, you didn't follow instructions. See, he's still got them. You didn't follow instructions. You were supposed to get rid of that. But anyways, that's why I say he's a processor. I mean, he's religious because he processes everything religiously, right? So he needs to go home and process that. Anyways, I want you guys to do something. You can't use your mics. Okay. I'm going to ask you guys. These are the rocks we talked about last night, okay? These rocks, for those of you that weren't here, represent the hardness of our heart. Jesus said divorce or separation of relationships. I like to interpret it like that, separation of relationships, but he was talking about marriage. He said divorce happens because of the hardness of the, rock, of, the, of the heart. Now, the hardness of the heart doesn't come in one day, and you're not born with it day one, okay? So the hardness of the, rock, the, the heart comes one rock at a time, one offense, one unforgiveness. A rock of rejection, a rock of guilt, and on and on and on. And when we get married, this is what happens when we get married. We bring all our rocks with us. But before we're married, we make sure that we hide them. We hide them. We're super nice before we get married. <laughs> you know, we actually call them before we get married if we're going to be late. We actually do things before we get married, all right? And then after, it's one rock at a time. <laughs> Not one day at a time, one rock at a time, and they start coming out. And so what happens is pretty soon, you're going to see what they're going to do. You're going to lay out, you're not going to have any left. They're all going to come out, and, and then you pick them all up and put them back in because you don't want to lose them, right? So you put all these rocks here. And I just want to arrange them because, you know, Ron does process, and right now he's processing. And he's thinking, this is Ron here, and he's thinking, what am I going to do? No, don't help. <laughs> I have to do, I have to set this up, not you. <laughs> Remember, there's no win-win here. It's always oh. lose. <laughs> win, lose. Remember that part, right? I win, you lose in this game, or else it won't work. <laughs> All right, here we go. So Ron meets Sonia, and they have a good relationship, then they have a bad relationship, and then they're not going to get married. And then somehow they resolve some of that stuff, and you know she gets born again, it all looks good. But he's smart. These are his rocks, by the way. Uh, he's smart. And so he doesn't show her everything, you know, not everything. And now they're married, and they're having to do life together. And they have to learn to dance with each other 24-7. So if I could have a little bit of dance music, and if you guys could get in dance position. <laughs> so I get a little bit. Let them remember. You know, well, we don't dance. Yeah, I know, I but do. you're not dancing yet. The music hasn't started. <laughs> You'd think as graduates they'd learn to listen to instructions. Have we got remember when back there? You can go ahead and start it. All right, here are the rules to young. this dance. That's your dance floor. Look, look, look. You're not, hey, hey, you're so excited about dancing. That's your dance floor. And the rules are you don't step on the rocks. But you can't go outside this dance floor. So go. 
Right. Now start dancing. Don't yeah. step on the rock. You see, no, no, you got to move. I know like the feet. No, no, I no, no, no. Your feet have to move. Well, you're already dead. So what I didn't tell them is that this is a landmine. All right? And, and sorry, and when you dance, you look at each other. That's the rules of dancing. You don't look at your feet and keep moving your feet. You're dead, Ron. You've just stepped on 10 landmines. Thank them. Doesn't matter. They're not in the same place they were. You moved them. You stepped them. I don't care what you did. They moved. We were strategically shuffling. Yes, doesn't work. That's a good answer, though. Thanks, you guys. That's a good answer. Strategically shuffling, but they're still there. And so what happens in relationships is that we try to dance around the rocks. It doesn't work. You have to be able to release those rocks, reveal them, rewrite them, and renew them. Because when you step on the rocks, you're blowing up. And for a long time, like they did, they tried to just stand still and do this. Well, who wants that relationship? Well, we're not moving. Keep looking down. Don't look at each other. Maybe we won't. You know, maybe today there won't be a blow up. Maybe today I can just hold it at less resentment. Maybe today I can control my anger. That's what anger management's about. Remember, Ron went to, an, he was certified as an anger management coach, and he went to the anger management course, and he came back, and he said, I said, how was it? And he said, great, if you know how to manage your anger, that's what they're teaching you. He goes, but there's no getting rid of it. There's no going to the root. They're giving you techniques to manage. That's not life. When Jesus talked about life, he talked about it more abundant, more abundant. Like you go from joy to joy. And even your challenges are because of the joy that's set before you. And so this morning, um, as we start uh, the day, I want to talk to you a little bit about some areas in your life that maybe revealing is really scary. Maybe revealing is about, um, can I do anything about it? See, when I think about people and faith, this is the, the, the and, and I see it now in relationships. I never saw it before. But when you would talk to people about your faith or about Jesus and, and you know, you, you were really had it down pat. You know, we were taught the four spiritual laws. Don't know how well they worked, but... That's how we were taught to witness. And I went to another place. I started sharing, you know, what God did for me personally. And that worked a little bit better. But people would always have, that works for you. But you don't get it. Like, I don't want to give up my life. I, I don't think that I could ever stop doing this or stop doing that. Or, you know, when, when you go to church, you, you, you can't drink and you can't smoke and you can't go out and you can't go to movies and you can't, you know, that was the era I was growing up in. And it was all, like I said, do's and don'ts. And so people couldn't see themselves being good enough. Not that they didn't want a relationship with God, but they couldn't be good enough. And I watch in marriages and relationships and friendships is that, most of the time, when there's a breakdown, we don't say we're not good enough necessarily. We'll say, you know what, you deserve someone better. It would be better if I left. Why? Because you realize that the expectations of that relationship, you don't know that you can get rid of the rocks because you don't know how. And that's the work that we do. It's teaching you how to reveal, rewrite, and renew so that those rocks, though they're there, you've uprooted them, and if they ever trigger, you say, is that one of my rocks? Because I don't serve it anymore. And just before Rob and Rocky come up, I am going to show you how you can begin to train your mind in living what I call above the line. What does that look like? Well, first of all, you have to know what you want. You have to know what you want in life. And I found out a lot 
of stuff that Dr. Leaf now put in scientific terms just excites me because now there's proof that, first of all, the Bible is true, but there's proof that this experiential, the feelings that we feel are real. Quite often people would say, just your feelings are wrong. Don't be led by your feelings. Think about it. Well, here's the truth that I believe about feelings, and that is that they trump. They, your feelings trump your thoughts. What do I mean by that? High emotion, low intelligence. Should I say it again? High emotion, low intelligence. How many of you know that anger is a feeling? Do you know that? That you feel it? It's not just a thought, you feel it. Does your mind not tell you that anger is not good? It doesn't usually resolve into good things. So if your mind knows that you shouldn't do that, I believe that's what the Apostle Paul was saying, I do what I shouldn't do. His mind knew it was wrong. But first, you've got to work with what's in the heart to conquer that. So how do you do that? That's what I want to show you this morning. But I need to identify, first of all, what you want. If you want, to, if you want to write some of these things down, that's fine. But I want some of you to just be bold and yell it really loud, okay? And just say it, and I'll write it down. So what do you want in the first square is, what do you want in your work or career? And if you're a stay-at-home mom or you're retired, that's what takes up the majority of your day, the hours of your day, okay? So what do you want more of in your work or your career? Just give me one word. Sorry? Freedom. Freedom. Appreciation? Appreciation. Yeah. Appreciation. What's the next one? Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Jenny, why don't you come up here and do this? Because like my parents used to say to me, I sent you to college and paid for it, so you probably know how to spell better. Okay, I heard a couple more. What do you want more for in your career or in your work? The time, that, the time you spent most during the day. Want time? Fun. Yes, fun. I like that one. Okay, let's go to the next one. Time, fun. Let's go to the next one. What do you want more of in your relationships? Love. Communication. Acceptance. Laughter. Okay, women, laughter. Understanding. Patience. Time. Honesty. Honesty. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, this could be dangerous. <laughs> All right, the next one, yourself. What do you want more of for yourself? Personally, patience? Honesty. Self-control. Self Self Clarity. Clarity. Discernment. Discernment. Did you hear that one? Clarity, peace, song. I missed one over here. What was said over here that's not on there is patience, honesty, self-control, clarity, discernment. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> Sleep. Was that my daughter-in-law? Health. Health. Integrity. Okay, that's a good start. You're being honest about this, right? You're telling the truth. Those of you, whatever you said, that's the truth, correct? Thank you, Jenny. Give her a hand. Much neater. My question now is, and don't answer this one, why not? Why do you not have? Let me ask another question. Are any of these things impossible to have? Even if you take the God equation out, you as a human being, 
Are any of these things impossible to have? Will anybody say yes to that? No. They're all within reason. So why are they not present in your life? Why not? The, well, or maybe there's some rocks. Maybe there's some don't know how. Maybe there's some consuming of those worry, stresses, and fears that you wrote down last night. Some of it must, might be your humanity, but not really if you knew how. See, I learned that the brain works by asking it questions. There's something that happens. That's why we ask a lot of questions and we get you to do exercises. Because there's something that happens when you ask a question. It triggers the brain to go into a different place. It has to answer. It has to answer. Now, when you don't want an answer from someone... You don't ask a question. See, when I was convinced my kids had told a lie, I never asked them if they told a lie. That would be setting them up for lying. I said, you did this, and these are the consequences. If I knew for sure that that had happened. And so... When you ask yourself a question, be prepared to give yourself an answer because you are accountable for why you don't have any of this or why you don't have it all or why you don't have some. Why not? So how do we have what we want? Well, first of all, by revealing what we want so we can work on <laughs> rewriting so we can have it. And one of the squares that I often put on in a church is, what do you want more spiritually? Maybe ask yourself that question. What do I want more spiritually, and why don't I have it? Is it because of discipline? Is it because of spiritual damage? And if I were to tell Sonia's story why she was an atheist, it really was because she respected her dad. And he was, and she loved her dad, and her dad must be right that there is no God. So she never questioned it. She never questioned it. He was a good man. He was an honorable man. But some spiritual damage in his past told him there was no God. And based on that belief system, he passed it on. So how? How? I do want you to use your piece of paper and put this red line there for a couple reasons. This red line, by the way, if you ever forget it after I leave, apparently I don't leave. I show up in nightmares <laughs> with a big red line. <laughs> Why? Because this red line is what I call reality. This red line is what is right now. If you don't without laboring it more and more, if you do not accept where you are, if you do not accept the reality that you're angry or you carry guilt or you carry shame or you carry things from your past, you have an addiction, if you don't acknowledge that, if you don't reveal that, then you're not even in reality. And you cannot change that reality unless, first of all, you reveal it, and secondly, you know what you want in order to put things in motion. But before you even get to your reality, there's two other lines that come before that. The first line is the line of intention. See, we all have intention. And our intention... When we get into a relationship, any relationship, and I'm going to talk about a romantic relationship right now, our intention is not to go into that relationship to break it up. Put it this way, I fly a lot, and if I were ever to walk up to the counter with my boarding pass and the captain came out of the plane and, and said to me, he said, Listen, ma'am, there's 50% chance 
that we will land this plane. But there's a 50% chance we may not. My intention is to land people. And if there's a 50% chance I'm not going to land, I ain't getting on that plane. Yet every day, people walk down this aisle with a 50% chance they could end. And yes, that's in the church too. Was that the intention though? Do you, did I get to the airport thinking I was going to get that message? No, my intention was to get on that plane and land in the city I'm supposed to be in. I wonder if I stood outside every wedding and said, hey, you know in about three years you're going to start thinking about it? <laughs> Think I could build my business? <laughs> about three years, you know, three and then seven, you get another itch. And then you're okay for a little while because the kids keep you busy. And then it hits you again at about 25, just before you hit 25, 25 years of marriage. I wonder how many people would think about their intention a little bit more seriously. Because your intention is because that person makes you feel good. Your intention is because they're fun. It feels complete. You're going to do life together. There are dreams that you're dreaming together, but nobody's revealed the rocks. So what's in between this line and this line? And see, this line is the line of decision. This is where the decision happens. Based on your decisions, your reality happens. But what's in between the intention and the decision. It's the rocks. It's that dance. It's the landmine. It wasn't your intention to walk out on her one day. It wasn't your intention to put a hole through the wall. It wasn't your intention to break her heart. That wasn't your intention. It wasn't your intention to stop communicating. Ladies, it wasn't your intention to nag from the time he woke up until he went to bed. Did you take the garbage out? That wasn't your intention. You were going to have a life that you dreamed about, but things got in the way. Triggers got in the way. Belief systems got in the way. And the decision then goes to living below the line. What's below the line? Let me just share a few of my own. Anger was below the line. Resentment was below the line. Bitterness was below the line. Unforgiveness was below the line. And then because of all that, and my growing up in the church, guilt came in. I shouldn't be like that. I shouldn't feel those things. I shouldn't wish that person dead right now. <laughs> right? Revenge was below the line. This is all me. What's below your line? Shame was below the line. Abuse was below the line. And the biggest one of all, my best friend, Control was below the line. This is where I lived for years and years and years. Will you ask, what's above the line? If you make the decision and you take care of this trail, this life of rocks, what's above the line is what Jesus promised us. If any man is in Christ. He is new. So what's above the line? Love is above the line. Joy, no matter what the circumstances are. Joy isn't happiness. Happiness depends on a happening. Joy is resident. It's inside of you. Count it all joy. That means it lives there. Peace is above the line. Harmony is above the line. I'm not going to put communication, because there can be a lot of communication below the line, but I'm going to put connection. Intimacy is above the line.
up here, there's freedom. Up here, there are dreams. Here, there's purpose. So is it possible to live your life above the line? I say yes. Is it possible to still slip below the line? Oh, yeah. But watch. This is a vicious circle. And it goes round and round and round. It might start with just a trigger of anger. And it gets deeper because we don't resolve. And then it gets deeper because we don't resolve. And pretty soon there's a guilt and shame. So you come back and say, okay, can't live like this. So for a moment you go up here and, and you realize this isn't, this isn't working for you. And so you make it right for a little bit, but you still haven't really resolved. You just make it right for a little bit. And then something gets triggered and back down here you come. You're walking through the rocks and back down here you come. See, there's something here that feeds this. You know what it is? Can anybody... Ego? Ego's down here, but it's something that feeds ego too. Fear. Who said that? Good job. Did you go to my course? <laughs> you just knew that? Wow. Wow. That's good. Fear. I'll tell you why fear leads this vicious circle. Because the fear of letting go to my anger, letting go of my anger meant I might not be safe. It kept me safe as a child. Controlling my environment kept me safe. And I tell you a story, my mom's here and she'll remember this story, but I was a nightmare to travel with because I got sick before we even left the driveway. <laughs> On these long trips, I was born in Belgium and going to, to um, Italy every year. And they just knew, you know, every year, here we go, she's going to get the worst of the worst. But I didn't figure it out until I did one of the exercises in our intensives, why it was that any time we left home, I got sick. Like severely sick, high fevers, throwing up. I mean, we, we flew from Belgium to Canada. It's a nine-hour flight. Literally, my mom was holding that white bag nearly the whole time, right from takeoff. What, I didn't figure this out till years and years later. Why is it? And it was because of the fear of losing control. I didn't know where we were going to be, what it, and we'd have to stop at hotels. I'll never forget the one night. It's still as vivid as I can remember. I always had to sleep knowing where the front door was. This was a little child. I wasn't even eight because we came to Canada when I was eight. So this was a trip to Italy that I got so sick. But I remember before I got into bed, I knew where the front door was. And I knew that if I had to escape, I knew how to escape. Well, I had the biggest nightmare. I had high fever. Thank God that where they put me to bed that night, there was another door, and it happened to be the bathroom door. So I ended up in the bathroom door, in the bathroom before my parents woke up. Well, the nightmare was that somebody was going to come and steal my family away from me. I was six or seven. Somebody in the night was going to come in that door and steal my family. See, I didn't have control of the environment when I left home. And that was scary. Now, I didn't figure that out. So how does that affect? So that's a childhood experience. I got sick when we traveled. How do I connect that dot to my present? How do I, you know, decide that that was the issue then? Because it was the same fear that went with me. If I didn't have control, my family would be taken from me. Same fear. Different circumstance, same fear. The fear that whatever belonged to me would be taken away. If it was love, if it was my children. I had two children in case one died. Is that not sick? Is that not sick? You know, you've got to have two in case one dies. But see, the fear of loss was so deep-rooted in me that the only thing I had was control. So when I was introduced, and that's fear-based, 
So when I was introduced to this concept of letting go of anger and letting go of control, I went, whoa, whoa, how will I live? How will I live without my two best friends? And I talk about it more on a, a deeper level in the book that we have downstairs. So fear here is what controlled me. But I thought I had control with the, with, with the, just my emotions. I had control so I would not, and here's a deeper feel, feeling, would, so I would not go crazy because loss can make you crazy. The hospitals are full of people having nervous breakdowns because of loss. So control was my anchor. And now somebody's telling me I have to let go of it. You can imagine the fear. The rewrite, I was told, was this. Forgiveness. It starts with forgiveness. I'll never forget the time I literally experienced forgiving someone. Someone that I had been trying to forgive for a long time, and it never worked. You know how you know you haven't forgiven? Because when you think about that person, or you're in the presence of that person, a knot is in your stomach. And you think back to things that were not nice with that person, then you know you haven't forgiven. Do you know when you know you have forgiven, when you can think of that person, and it could be the rapist, and you're still wishing for the best? for them. And it could be a rapist. Because when you don't have a victim mentality and you have an above the line mentality that this is what you want at any cost, then not even that rapist can keep you down here. Ron used to explain it this way. We grew up in church and yet I'd never heard forgiveness this way. We do a process on forgiveness. And he introduces it like this. He said, forgiveness looks like this. And he said, now I know you know I'm doing the sign of the cross and I'm talking about Jesus. And those ultimate words that Jesus said, forgive them. And Ron put it this way. He said he could have stopped right there. He could have said, Father, forgive them. But he didn't. He went in with compassion. He said, the most powerful part of that statement for you and me to learn from is the next few words he said. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's how I learned to forgive those that offended me. What if that person really, was it their intention? Or was it hurt people hurt people? And that in itself should be enough, but it wasn't for me. I had to see that person as a little person, as a child. I had to see them and see through what we call walking in their moccasins. We're used to hearing that in Canada, walk a mile in someone else's moccasins. I had to see that child in the walk of their life before they came in contact with me. What rocks, what hurts happened to them that could do that to me? And it wasn't about me anymore. It was about, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When I experienced that, and I shot up here, and that was literally the first time I've experienced forgiveness on that level, where it wasn't just, oh, well, just let it go, that's just who that is but wishing the best for that other person. Going one step further, forgiveness is the most selfish thing I've ever done for me. Why is it selfish? Because it set me free. Because I was now free to make my own decisions, not based on my hurts. When I told you about my marriage last night nearly ending, Forgiveness was not an option, didn't matter either way. Whichever way it was going to go, we stay or we go, forgiveness was not going to be an option. 
Because to not forgive puts a noose around my neck. I'm the one who goes around with those toxic feelings and toxic thoughts all day long. That's toxic down here. And the Bible says when you get to bitterness, it eats your bones. It kills you. So what is it up here? <coughs> what is it up here that has this going for it? Not love. Love is a decision. Compassion. Jesus healed by compassion. Everything he did was through compassion. Compassion forces you to forgive. Compassion causes you to live above the line. Now, here's the cool thing about compassion. Compassion's in your DNA. You don't have to drum it up. You don't have to try to say, oh, I've got to have compassion today. All you have to do is reignite it. It's already there. Love is a decision. You know, I love my grandkids. doesn't mean I love all kids. Right? There's a difference between the love I have for my grandchildren and the love I just have for kids in general. I love kids just because I love kids. But I can have compassion on every child. Watch what I mean by that. Let's say you walked out Georgia Street's that way, right? You're on Georgia Street, busy street. And there's a mom holding a baby and there's a mom holding a two-year-old's hand. And she's there by herself and she's waiting to cross the street. But the two-year-old gets impatient. And, and by the way, you're standing over here next to the child. Okay, so there's the mom holding a baby, holding a two-year-old's hand, and you're standing here. And that baby gets, the two-year-old gets impatient. Now there's traffic going. The two-year-old gets impatient, lets go of its, his mother's hand, and begins to run. What are you going to do? Just stand there? Now, you know that mom's not going to make it with a baby to also, she's going to try, but who's got a better chance of saving the baby? You, right? Is anybody here considering not jumping out and helping and whooping that kid up? You can go like this or like this. Would you do it? Would you get out there? And are you thinking, I'm going to be a hero today, or is it just natural? Is it instinct? It's instinct. That's compassion. Let me tell you something about that child when it grows up. Might end up on the street. Could be a drug addict. Might it be in jail. Worse yet, he may never thank you for saving his life. But were you thinking all that in that moment? No. In that moment, you had compassion even if you live here. They do what they call a compassion workshop in uh, jails where there's reoffending, reoffending, um, whatever they're called, criminals? <coughs> Anyways, reoffenders. And for some reason, they don't last very long out of jail and they come back in. They do this compassion power workshop with the inmates and over 90% never reoffend. Why? Because they plugged into what was theirs and they reignited it. That's called living above the line. Now, walking out of here today, that's the how, but you do need to take care of this. And we're not going to resolve all of this today, but it's a start for you. It's a start to look at it. But here's the thing, because there's guilt here. Am I going to feel guilty every time I'm, I slip down here? No, because I do. But here's the difference. I used to live here and visit here. Now I do my best to live here. And yes, once in a while I visit here. But I know I'm there. I'm going, I'm not laying my bed here again. I'm not letting this control me again. I'm not letting fear set in. That could have set in when Ron passed away. The fear could have set in to not do and want to do life on my own. But then I remembered my purpose. I remembered the four years he kept reminding me of our purpose and our legacy. You're sitting here today 
attending this because of the founder, my husband, because he believed this would not end. Teaching people to live above the line where they were wired and meant to live and healing relationships one broken heart at a time is our purpose. And so when I laid him down to rest and when he took his last breath, I knew he was leaving me purpose. He was saying the dreams are not complete. Our assignment's not over. That family portrait, your four squares, what do you want? And many of us don't have what we want because of this and because we don't know how. 